Okay, we're together again in Biology of Fishes on the 6th of November, uh, 2012. Uh, last time we met, uh, I focused on uh, perception of environment and learning. And uh, there's probably uh, way more to say about that than I said. We really didn't talk much about uh, some of the modern uh, animal training procedures uh, for discrimination threshold measurements really pretty fancy and pretty sophisticated. Um, we only basically dealt with classical, classical conditioning, you know, sort of Pavlov's dog type experiments. Uh, I'm going to just skip through here and uh, take a look at some of the things that came up. You know, one of the things that came up was a model for perception of uh, temperature change, which is always... Uh, the case when an animal is moving through a habitat that involves variation in temperature. This is a, an hypothesis that has to do with uh, responding to thermal lag to uh, get direction. And I'll have a little more to say about that when I talk about uh, behavioral regulation of environment in the next segment. Um, I'm thinking about something I said that caused me to go back and check. Uh, what was it? Oh, I think it was the fact that when I talked about uh, chemo perception and um, how sensitive um, the olfactory system is in some fishes, I made mention of the fact that fish can uh, detect, um, can, can be... Um, experimentally shown to detect uh, the presence of particular substances that are at very low uh, levels. Um, in the case of copper and salmon, this particular uh, source, and I don't have references here, but uh, suggested that salmon could detect uh, nine parts per billion, uh, which is only two-tenths the incipient lethal. And I think I ad lived at this point to remark that uh, I recalled an experiment in which uh, American eels were shown to uh, detect uh, some concentration of some toxic substance at a concentration that was so low that the authors calculated there was only one molecule in the olfactory capsule uh, at that concentration and were just taking the concentration and the volume and working it out and I got a couple of uh, surprise looks I think Allison gave me one of them so I went back and checked and yeah I exaggerated it's not one molecule it's three or four molecules and the concentration is 10 to the minus 18th and everybody understands how you do concentrations in that sort of uh, designation you know it means one part of substance and 10 to the 18th parts, 10 to the positive 18 parts of, of volume. And so that, at that ratio, it works out to two or three or four molecules could be there. But I, I pointed out that there's been a lot of criticism of those kinds of results because that calculation assumes a uniform distribution of molecules or substance per unit volume. And in fact, there may be some some uh, accumulation that would result in amplification of the signal by, for example, adsorption of molecules to the olfactory epithelium. So take those with a grain of salt, but still I think there's no debate that fish have very sensitive noses. Uh, <clears throat> talked about the eyes and uh, the fact that the eye is typical vertebrate eye, <clears throat> but uh, the lens and the way uh, fish focus uh, their eyes to accommodate for distance is a little different. Um, and I think, um, you know, we, we sort of ended talking about the visual window, and I'd like everybody uh, in the group to have a command of the ideas here. And the ideas have to do with the fact that it's refraction, not reflection, refraction with an R, R-E-F-R-A-C-T, refraction of light as it passes from one medium to another that causes this sort of fisheye 
lens effect. Um, the angle is about 100 degrees. It's 97.6. That's not. Uh, I don't guess it's not vital that you know exactly how many degrees that amounts to. So when fish look up, they look up through a visual window, a visual window that basically is is a cone with uh, an angle uh, of 97.6 degrees. And I think I stopped here because I didn't want to overstay my welcome and spend a lot of time uh, more than the class period allowed by by simply pointing out that <coughs> the main functions of vision, obviously, well, I don't know if it's obvious or not, but food finding and capture, being able to see prey and seize it, is probably a, a major function. But fishes also use their their sense of vision to... Uh, find and distinguish mates from non-mates, uh, but they use other senses too, for example, olfaction. Um, fishes use their vision in schooling, if they are schooling species, to maintain uh, separation and orientation, separation from conspecifics and, and parallel orientations, but they also use the lateral line sense. I think I've pointed that out too. Fish uh, use their vision, obviously, to see predators and avoid them. And uh, they use their vision in spatial orientation, uh, finding their way around in the habitat and finding uh, and refinding shelter. Uh, Rheotaxis is um, an orientation, uh, a taxic response, and I'll talk about that uh, in the next segment, to the flow of the, of the medium um, and fish focus on particles coming by to help them detect which way the water is flowing relative to their positions. Uh, fish have some other senses that uh, are kind of intriguing. Uh, for example, they have a sense of up and down, as you and I do. Um, and it's not just uh, gravity in their case, but uh, actually the odalis, uh, the the ear stones, that occur in the in the uh, inner inner ear uh, bear down in response to the force of gravity and by uh, detecting the point in in the system where the ear stone is bearing down, uh, the fish can tell which way is uh, you know the orientation of gravity, which way is down, which way is up. But vision also complements that sense. And uh, fish um, uh, interpret up as being the direction from which light is coming in a lighted system. And um, the result of this is uh, called the dorsal light response. Uh, and those of you who have kept aquaria probably have noticed the dorsal light response. If light is coming from a direction other than up, then the fish uh, respond by tilting themselves uh, sort of splitting the difference between gravity and and the signal of the light, uh, you know, the vector type response, uh, turning um, so that they're, you know, getting a, a signal from down from gravity as well as uh, up from the source of the light from the side, which causes them to tilt over. And people have done experiments in which they've removed otoliths or knocked out the... Uh, the uh, nerves from the inner ear, and you can, you know, turn fish basically upside down. But the swim bladder uh, also enters into that equation, and it, it uh, gives a center of uh, buoyancy, which would have to be uh, overcome if you were going to try to turn upside down. Um, fish uh, presumably sense the Earth's magnetic, the Earth's magnetic field. And uh, there's been lots of work uh, uh, searching for and finding uh, magnetite uh, in the inner ears and brains of all kinds of animals, turtles, uh, uh, tunas, uh, uh, marine mammals, I think. And um, I was uh, looking at some old experiments done back in the facility where I worked in Hawaii uh, 40 years ago, showing that, you know, uh, yellowfin tuna can react to uh, 
magnetic fields, uh, experimental magnetic fields with magnetite that's in their in their brains, the yellowfin tuna. Uh, so that they may be able to use a magnetic compass. In other words, uh, move through the oceans, uh, uh, essentially following a, a uh, compass that is in their brains. But, you know, I don't think that the evidence has really been uh, convincing, completely convincing that that any animal really does this because the the uh, weakness of the field that they respond to or the strength of the field is so low and it's so easy to have artifactual uh, things going on in experimental systems that it's difficult to sort out the true uh, the true relationship. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it turned out that that um, fish can use a magnetic compass as well as using a sun compass and I don't know if I talk about that later um, um, well I guess I did right here as a matter of fact I think I added this slide because I didn't have it in the other set I was looking at in review fish have a, fish have a time sense uh, that enables them to know when a specific time interval has elapsed and uh, you know, people have done experiments by uh, using conditioning techniques, signaling the fish, okay, now this, the clock is starting, and now the time that uh, I am, um, the time that's important has ended, and maybe it's 30 seconds, maybe it's one minute, and at the end of that time, you've got a little window of opportunity, only a few seconds to respond, or you don't get fed, you don't get a reinforcement. If you respond, and show me, the investigator, that you realize that the end of the interval has happened, then you get a reward. And so fish are trained that way, and the, the interval gets narrower and narrower to see if they can really measure one minute plus or minus five seconds or plus or minus 15. And I think that's a fascinating thing, but to me the most fascinating part of that story is the fact that when you change the temperature, you know, you might expect that the Arrhenius effect would cause the fish to misjudge the time. But the fish is able to compensate. So when the temperature goes up, it still knows when one minute has happened. Which I think is pretty neat. Uh, fish can know the time of day. Uh, other animals do too, birds, uh, by using what's called a sun compass. Basically, you know, if it's... Um, if uh, it's if the sun's in the east, then it's morning, and if it's in the west, it's evening. Um, lots of clever experiments involving uh, orientation of fish in open tanks exposed to the sky and to various artificial suns have shown these kinds of things to happen. Uh, fish can use that uh, sun compass, maybe also with the magnetic compass, uh, to... Uh, move around uh, in a large-scale sense. Um, you know, to move uh, presumably, you know, north in the, in the, uh, in the northern hemisphere during, uh, during summer and then south again during the, as fall comes on. Uh, know which way to go. Fish know to, to move uh, uh, you know, toward shore because they've learned some local landmarks and they can tell from the time of day they will, they will use an artificial uh, sun to orient in the proper direction to a shoreline and if you fake them out by changing the, the relationship of the sun to the shoreline then they'll go the wrong way. So there's pretty, pretty clear evidence that fish are using a combination of the sun compass and, and maybe something like dead reckoning to uh, find their way around in the habitat. And, uh, you know, dead reckoning basically says that if I move around and I just keep track of uh, my distance moved and my direction of movement, then in theory I know where I am relative to where I've, where I've been. I can return, you know. Maybe uh, if I have some landmarks along the way to sort of assist me in knowing my position, then I'm better off. And I've had some experiences, like everybody that's worked in the field with fish, you know, I've had experiences that sort of uh, made me say, gee, you know, I can't believe I saw that. Uh, 
where fish seem to be able to do things that I wouldn't have expected them to do. Uh, you know, you're out, you're doing uh, ultrasonic telemetry. You have a fish, in this case, uh, <clears throat> as I recall, a long-nosed gar with a, an ultrasonic transmitter on it. And you're using uh, underwater um, uh, microphones, uh, basically a hydrophone, to orient, to triangulate on the fish and follow it around in the in the system. And uh, you know the fish is moving all over the place. It's obviously foraging, moving along a shoreline in a, a circuitous fashion. And then at some point, you know, something happens and the fish uh, stops moving where it's uh, stops meandering around and just goes straight back to the place where maybe it was uh, it was. It started from at the, at the beginning of the day or at the beginning of the evening, you know, almost a straight line shot back across the lake through open water, um, and you sort of get the impression the fish uh, knew where it was relative to where it wanted to go, and when it got done with its business of searching, it simply went home. You know, it, it made a straight path back to back to where it uh, started. So these kinds of things happen, and some of them are a little bit uh, hard to hard to fathom as they as they go on. I think everybody has a has a list of strange things they've seen fish do. You probably do too, or will have as you watch them, or if you're a fisherman particularly. Okay, well I want to I want to end that material now and move on to talk about um, something else that ends with that. I want to talk about how fish use uh, the information they gather about uh, environment relative to their own physiological state. Ah, uh, Allison points out that I might need to hand out some material and I think I'll pause and do that. Okay, we're back um, in session now, I, I had the computer pause for a moment while I passed out the the three slide per page handout for this segment of material. And as as I did that, and Sean asked me, uh, you know, do fish uh, learn to perceive their world uh, developmentally? At least that's the way I interpreted his question. You know, do larval fish begin without uh, sensory abilities, um, and then these develop as they as the fish grows? I I don't know the answer to that, and I, and I suspect that there's been very little done with really early larvae, and maybe even very small, weak, fragile juveniles, just because they are weak and fragile. Uh, a lot of the effort that we have to expend in this sort of research is, is the effort needed to, uh, uh, have, to provide the fish a way of demonstrating its own capabilities to the researcher. You know, that's why we do conditioning experiments, and that's why we put the fish in little confined situations. Obviously, if the fish uh, are using these things uh, to their advantage under normal circumstances, they're having to use them in open field situations. And presumably, uh, uh, there is some developmental biology that goes on relative to environmental perception. Um, I mean, fish don't have fully formed ears, I don't think, as, as larvae, for example. So they probably don't uh, hear much until they get to be bigger. And a lot of things are matters of scale, uh, so that a larval fish is so small that, for example, I'm not sure how uh, the vibrations uh, of the water or sound in water would, would uh, be perceived by a really small larval animal just because it's... Its its scale its size is approaching this size of the the period of the vibration maybe if it's really small so I guess there's some things that have to be considered here but they're not ones that I've thought much about obviously I don't think there's been much research on these things either probably at least it's not the sort of thing that has come to my attention but then there are lots of things I mean a world of things that haven't come to my attention. So um, one of the things it has is, uh, is sort of a general focus on behavioral regulation of the environment. It's one of my favorite subjects, as you probably can tell uh, from lab 
5, which, by the way, is, um, I think, due today. Uh, no, no, it's not today. It's the help session. I just was just throwing that out to cause you to say, what about my Lab 5? No, no, I forgot. No, today is the help session for Lab 5. It'll be due next week. And it deals with behavioral regulation of environment. And maybe some of what I say today will help you um, uh, have a better handle on some of the ideas there and, and sort of maybe reach some new insights of your own. Uh, I'll begin by saying that something I've already said, and that is that you know fish make physiological responses, and uh, and those complement behavioral responses. In fact, they always precede, I think, the behavioral response. So I would say that behavioral environmental regulation or uh, the regulation of multivariate environment by behavioral means, normally by moving around in it and oriented fashion, <coughs> that, that, that's one of the two adaptive strategies that, that animals use to accommodate for the variation that they have to deal with through uh, time and space. And for the most part, the behavioral environmental regulation of the sort that I'm going to focus on uh, depends on the animal's ability to organize its behavior in, in such a way that it puts itself into favorable subsets of the habitat and allows it to avoid um, others. So, you know, we're back to this uh, graph that I've already shown, I guess. Um, available habitat uh, has a, a broad range, let's assume. Uh, if it doesn't, if available habitat is a single point on the x-axis, then you don't really need to worry much about regulating because there's nothing to regulate behaviorally. You might need to worry about regulating physiologically. <coughs> so, uh, if available habitat uh, has extremes from a low value here, uh, a lower limiting value is what I was thinking rather than, uh, or maybe I was thinking uh, lethal there, I guess. Uh, what I think I was thinking when I put these subscripts on the E's is preferred environment upper avoidance limit and um, uh, upper lethal uh, maybe level and so the idea would be that the animal um, can deal with all of this variation in the external world and compress the external world into a into a subset that is between the avoidance limits uh, upper and lower so that to, to the extent that this blue curve departs from the one-to-one -one line, the animal achieves some measure of regulation. And if it departs and is straight across at EP, then it's perfectly regulating. So it's the same old idea, except now we're talking behavior instead of physiology, between a conformer that's along the one-to-one -one line uh, and a regulator that is uh, horizontal. And with the intersection right here at EP, hopefully. So I guess if you're thinking about, uh, uh, you know, uh, behaviorally, uh, well, uh, let's not get off on, uh, I'm, I'm about to get off into sessile animals and all of that issue, but I won't do that. We're going to assume our fish are able to move around. So... Um, Successful uh, regulation of environment uh, means keeping yourself um, uh, at the preferred values, uh, maybe maximizing the proportion of time that you uh, spend at the preferred level of environment and progressively lesser amounts of time or frequency of occurrence at lesser, at more extreme levels. And finally, uh, no time at all below the avoidance limit or above the avoidance limit. And I kind of like this uh, diagram, which you won't find in any any textbook, I don't think, um, which sort of puts together the ideas of physiological and behavioral regulation. I like to think of this as a two-stage process. So the available habitat has this range of values here, all the way from ELL to EUL, this red arrow. And uh, through... Uh, through behavioral means, the animal can compress that range into the range here between the upper and lower avoidance limits. 
just like you saw in the previous graph. And now, it only has to deal physiologically with a world that consists of values between the upper and lower avoidance limits. It doesn't have to go over that whole range. So we just translate that error there into the x-axis on this graph and now talk about the selected range of environment. And now, if you add the physiological fine-tuning on top of the selection behaviorally, you end up with a very narrow range, perhaps, of internal environment. So I think salinity would be a good variable to use, you know, as the E on this kind of graph, where the range of salinities, you know, possible goes all the way from zero to maybe uh, three times or four times seawater. And the animal is able to, sub, to, to generate a subset of, of that distribution that's a narrower uh, externally, that is the, the, the environment that's right around its skin surface. And then it takes that subset and translates it into an internal subset that's narrower still. <coughs> The, uh, the range of, of blood uh, osmotic concentrations. So I kind of like that graph. I think you ought to keep that one and use it for your own if you like it. Uh, some points of uh, uh, sophistication, I guess, or reference or wisdom about all this is that, you know, animals don't have the choice of just dealing with one variable. Uh, they have to do it all in the context of the joint distribution of environment. And some components of environment tend to change together, but others are changing uh, uh, along different axes uh, independently. Orthogonally, I guess, is the word that, that somebody might use who does uh, multivariate analysis. So it's the joint distribution of a multidimensional world that has to be regulated and a lot of that regulation has to be accomplished without any real knowledge about the rest of the world. Only, you only really know about here and now, or about here and now and recent past events, for example. Now, through learning, you may learn a lot about the lay of the land and the rest of the world and be able to go back to that particular location like that old long nose guard did, you know, straight across the lake back to a particular place where it liked to hang out or a particular brush pile that the big bass hangs out around. But still, you know, when you think about the, the chemical environment and the, what we call ephemeral environment, the components that change from moment to moment and day to day and from day to night, like temperature and dissolved oxygen and maybe the presence of a plume of some material, uh, that that's largely... Uh, uh, unknown and unknowable, not very predictable. Um, and bioregulation also has to be accomplished um, in habitats that not just present one distribution through space all the time, but a distribution through space that's constantly in flux so that, you know, what's warm now is cool later and vice versa. Every time the wind shifts, the, the world changes in the distribution of the components of things that are important to animals. So, you know, uh, man, I, you know, I'm about just about convinced you now it's almost impossible for an animal to, to have any hope of achieving this kind of management of its of its world. So, you know, is maybe uh, why why bother doing it? You know, maybe just be a oyster and just hunker down in place and. And close your, you know, close up when you have to, and open up when you can, and just take it as it comes. Maybe that would be a, another strategy. And maybe some fishes do that too. You know, benthic forms may, may have to deal with um, very little means of moving around over large spans of distance, at least. But um, you know, I like to say that everybody's got to be someplace, and you might as well be someplace good instead of someplace bad if you if you have a choice. So, and maybe. Uh, you know, the amount of work it takes to uh, achieve a certain degree of control is not so much, you know, not much greater than it would be if you just didn't bother. You know, maybe it's not a lot of extra work to achieve behavioral uh, enviro regulation. I think uh, I 
I got a BT there thinking about behavioral thermal regulation, but I've got to ease every place else, so I meant behavioral and viral regulation. Maybe it's not all that hard. Maybe it's kind of automatic in a lot of ways. You know, ecofish can do it. And ecofish doesn't have a brain. You know, that's that's kind of comforting, right? So there might be some ways that are not so difficult, um, you know, that, that animals can use. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, effort invested in trying to understand um, how animals environ regulate because knowing how they environ regulate gives you a better clue on where they are. And if you know where they are, you know where to go catch them. And so fisheries have focused a lot of attention on understanding the mechanisms involved in fish distribution. Uh, you know, and they almost put the two words together, distribution and abundance. Have you ever heard that? I mean, it's almost like that's considered one thing. And, of course, if everybody is using the same rule set and is uh, individually, all ecologically distributing itself in the good place, then pretty soon everybody's in the good place. So they're concentrated there, right? And maybe that's where you go catch them. So one of the ways of studying uh, environmental regulation with temperature particularly in focus, and that's where most of the study has been, um, is by examining catch per unit effort. CPUE is the acronym that you'll see in the fisheries literature. And, uh, you know, a lot of times this comes from commercial fisheries. And, uh, you know, there's a big problem with that kind of data, and it is this. It is that commercial fishermen aren't stupid, and they're not going to waste their time fishing where they don't expect to find any fish. And so the strength of the data in terms of sample size, sampling effort, is obviously going to be very uneven, with a lot more effort expended in uh, subsets of the habitat and under environmental conditions where fish are expected to be, and very little expended at the, at the perimeter you know, out there close to those avoidance limits. So, you know, maybe you can do it, weight it, catch per unit of effort, but if the amount of effort is very small, then the variance, the error variance on the estimate just goes out of, you know, out the window. So it, it's not a not very good. Get around some of that by doing, uh, you know, regulated uh, 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 sampling. That is, by sampling uh, by rule according to some set of protocols that are designed to sample all available parts of the habitat, if not uh, equally, at least rep in a representative way. And one of the real successes, I think, in this area is the one uh, that my colleagues in Texas Parks and Wildlife have pursued over the last 30 or 40 years, which is a very well-regulated sampling program, a stratified sampling program, where they go out and they sample in each piece of habitat, each piece of geographic area in a representative way uh, to try to arrive at unbiased estimates of abundance and distribution. You know, uh, the problem of measuring environmental availability is that if you only sample where the fish is, uh, then you're going to get a good picture of that environment, but what you're not going to get is a very good picture of what other environments are possible. In other words, which, what else is there out there? You know, If you're only sampling where the fish are caught, then what you're not doing is sampling where the fish aren't caught. So you have to be careful to... Uh, to uh, work at gathering information about not just the fish's uh, distribution relative to the environmental factor, but the distribution of the environmental factor relative to the whole available space. Many telemetry studies have failed in that area because the tendency is to follow the fish around and only make measurements where the fish where you're where you're finding the fish, and uh, you can't know what. You know the meaning of, of you can't know the meaning of one uh, value without knowing its proportionate distribution relative to other possible values. You know, I tell you, I caught all my fish at 29 degrees. Well, 
29 degrees, the preferred temperature, right? Obviously. Well, yeah, except till I tell you that the, all the temperatures between 28.5 and 29.5. Not too surprising I caught them all at 29. I'd have caught them all at 13, you know. If that's what the temperature was, they might be dead, but if they were still alive, that's where I would have caught them. So you've got to keep that in mind. That's a part of the sophistication of thinking through in a mechanistic way these kinds of relationships instead of just taking people's um, claims at face value, including mine. You have to, to look at them carefully, critically. So horizontal and vertical gradient tanks are very useful in estimating uh, uh, the selection uh, or the value of different values of, of a particular variable like temperature to that particular fish under that particular set of environmental conditions. But, you know, you always realize that this is a very artifactual situation. I can promise you, ecofish is not too influenced by all the things you're not worrying about, but real fish are. So, uh, gradient experiments in the lab are always subject to a concern about uh, the meaning that those experiments have in the real world when it's a multivariate world and it's not at all well just, you know, organized in its distribution. You know, gradient experiments like the one Ecofish operated in, you know, 29 degrees is always on the other side of 28 degrees from 27 degrees. You can't get from 27 to 29 without going through 28. You know, but that's not the way it is in the real world. You might be able to find a discontinuity and make an instant jump. In other words, real world may be patchy in its distribution is still being nice and continuous and smooth in its distribution. Um, so vertical gradient tanks, you know, have the additional problem or concern of the fact that you got gravity and you got light and you got all these things that tend to vary naturally in the vertical dimension superimposed on the response that you're you're trying to follow, like DO. So, you know, real fish do that. They operate in the vertical. They take advantage of vertical uh, variation in things like temperature and light and dissolved oxygen. Um, so, you know, it's hard to sort of tease out the effects of those different components. Electronic shuttle boxes. I was reminded of these old experiments by a paper Allison sent me not long ago. Um, this is a device that I developed and uh, used to measure the preferred temperature of a whole variety, I think six different species of freshwater fishes, bluegills, largemouth bass, uh, black crappie, a uh, little carp, uh, something else, maybe yellow perch. And uh, the way it works is that um, take an ordinary aquarium divided into two compartments, uh, with a double wall partition, we actually used uh, two plexiglass uh, walls separated by about an inch and a half of space. And through that double wall partition, there's a tunnel made out of a little piece of PVC pipe. And mounted through the walls of that tunnel are uh, some photo detecting devices, little photo cells that look across the tunnel. And on the other side are a couple of light sources. And the reason for having two instead of just one is by two you can get direction. And the rule is simple. The rule is the last light beam broken or the last photocell triggered is the direction the fish was passing through. So is he going from left to right like he is here? Then he would have broken that right beam after the left beam. Um, if he stopped and he backed out, he still broke the beam last to the side he's in. He's in the side where he broke the beam last. So the way this thing worked, you know, at this point all I've told you is that you can monitor which side of a tank a fish is on. But now what if the tank itself responds to that? Now here's where you depart drastically from the real world and go into the experimental world. Because normally habitats don't respond to the movements of fish. You know, fish respond to the movements of habitat. But we use this loop to understand how the fish were behaving relative to the environmental factor of concern. And the way this system responded was, and this was way back before 
uh, computers almost, but certainly before uh, any kind of cheap computer. Uh, we're talking about uh, discrete um, components like uh, resistors and capacitors and relays, you know, that kind of thing. We're building our own little uh, computers, you know, very simple-minded computers back then. And the way this little computer worked was when the fish goes through and breaks, uh, whichever beam, if the fish breaks the right beam last, then that tells the system, hey, I want to turn up the heat. And so uh, a device called a bistable flip-flop or multivibrator triggers, it's a pair of, it's a relay system, and it triggers to the right side and that turns on a heater. And that heater stays on as long as that fish is over there or until some upper limit switch is exceeded. And we usually did that to keep from frying any fish. Um, so, And then when the fish goes back to the left, the whole thing reverses and the temperature starts dialing down. Now in the original version of this system, and you can read about this in a paper published in Science in about 1972. In the original version of this system, uh, it was just free running. You know, when the fish went right, the heater turned on, it ran, it turned on, and it, it heated at its capacity as long as the fish was over there. And when the fish went left, the heater turned off. And there was a cooling coil on the left-hand side that caused, you know, uh, essentially a, a heat sink to, to pull down the whole tank to cool off both sides. But we ran into these military surplus devices called uh, comparators. And what that circuitry did was uh, arrange, allow for an offset. And so we actually had an offset of a couple of degrees between the two temperatures, right and left. So the right side is always two degrees or a degree and a half warmer than the left. And here's the pattern of temperature that you could expect to be generated if the heater heated at a constant uniform rate. Of course it didn't. I mean, it was heating more when it was cold and, you know, it had greater effect on the temperature when the temperature was low than when the temperature was already way high. So these lines aren't exactly straight in the original design. So here's the fish right. Uh, by the way, the solid line indicates the side where the fish is. So the fish is on the right side, the warm side. At this point, fish changes sides, goes to the low side. That causes the whole system to cool off. At this point, it switches back over again, goes to the right side. And you can see that what happens here you got to sort of dial your own temperature. You know, the fish can control its world by, by the proper balancing of its time and its distribution between the two compartments. Like real fish do, except in the real fish's case, the world is fixed and it's moving around in it. In this case, the world is moving and the fish is just selecting. At any one moment, the fish only has two choices. Uh, T and T minus delta T, whatever those two values are. But by making that choice, the fish can keep itself in a band of temperature that proved to be, in most cases, about two and a half or three degrees. That was the, that was the bandwidth for bluegill, for example. So, you know, in that paper in science, we talked about... Uh, sort of uh, the logical next experiment. And the logical next experiment was, um, what happens if you do away with delta T? What happens if delta T goes to zero? You know, so is the fish able to regulate in a system where there is no differential in space, but only in time? So we're going to play a relativistic game here. And so I had a technician, and uh, Tom Biles, and I asked Tom to, turn this barrier in the middle into just a perforated uh, barrier to keep the fish, uh, you know, to, to separate the tank into two compartments, but it would allow mixing of the water completely between the two. And I had in mind he'd just take a uh, new plexiglass and drill a bunch of holes in it so it would be kind of porous, you know. We'd keep the configuration, everything looking alike, but it would be, it would not be any restriction to the flow of water. Well, Tom, being frugal, didn't do that. He took a bunch of little scraps of plexiglass and glued them together and made sort of a frame and then stretched a bunch of black uh, vinyl electrical tape, you know, to make a grid. 
Well, if you know anything about black electrical tape, you know that it's not very waterproof. So when he put that in the tank, you know, it held together about a day, and then uh, it came unstuck, and that shroud of black tape just sort of collapsed on the bottom of the tank. We also uh, put this cooling coil in between the two um, the two sides of the partition just to try to keep things as equal on the two sides of the tank and the heater. Everything was in there together in between the two. The whole tank, in other words, was warming or cooling, but there was no difference between the two sides. So, you know, it turned out the fish thought that all of that plumbing and stuff was kind of cool. You know, and it liked to hide out in there between those two partitions. And so... It did. And you would think, well, that's the end of the game because that fish is going to be, you know, going to be a fry baby or a frozen little fish, you know. If it, well, it didn't work that way at all. This bluegill um, would sit there in between these two frames until things went too warm and then it would get out, make a very purposeful move through the tunnel in the right direction to turn the thermostat. Uh, the other way, and, and regulated just as well. And we got the paper, we got the graph published in that paper in Science, I think, showing that the temperature uh, control achieved by that fish was just as good as it was by fish that had a, a degree and a half or two degrees of difference to work with. So you know, when you think about that, um, maybe I'm wrong when I said to Allison in response to the paper she sent, you know, learning may be involved, but it's not necessary. Uh, but these little bluegill, either that was the Einstein among bluegills, and I think this is what we said to the editor, uh, you know, when they criticized this as being a sample size of one, we said, okay, either bluegills can do this, all of them, or this was the Einstein among bluegills that we just happened to find. And he said, I agree, all fish can, all bluegill can do this, if one can. And, you know, it's just as arbitrary, in a sense, as controlling the temperature in this room would be by going up to the wall and turning the thermostat, you know, uh, you could pro, you could you could make it so that clockwise was cooling and counterclockwise was warming, right? If you wanted to fly in the face of convention, and it would work just as well. But normally we think of clockwise means up, and counterclockwise means down. If you've got a twist type thermostat nowadays, of course, they're all punch the button and it's digital. But so it's kind of neat that fish can do the equivalent of dial your own temperature. Uh, we did, I think, realize that Rosen and Mayer had done this, and I think we referenced Rosen and Mayer's work in our paper. And what they did was train goldfish to lever tap uh, in order to get a reward of cooling water. And they turned on the heat and let it run, and the fish, in order to keep the thing from cooking them, had to go up and and hit a lever to get a jet of cool water into the tank. And what they showed was that goldfish could could regulate the upper limit of the temperature regime that they were in. They wouldn't allow it to breach lethally high levels. They'd hit harder as the water got warmer. If you turned up the heater's capacity so that it heated faster, they'd hit it faster. And I think we did reference that paper, but, you know, that was a a little different from what we did. What we were interested in was showing that fish could regulate their temperature and what Rosen and Mare showed was that they could be trained, they could train themselves or could be trained to do the equivalent of turning the thermostat. And maybe the two experiments come together in a moment. Okay, so you've already learned about behavioral uh, regulation of temperature in the context of acclimation in Lab 5. And and I think I had a little figure that was like this one. Maybe it offered a few more alternatives. Uh, Zahn's types of temperature preference acclimation. And I only show three of them here. Uh, where the preferred temperature tends to vary as a function of acclimation temperature. Being, in all cases, uh, higher than acclimation when the fish is acclimated to a low temperature. And lower than the acclimation temperature when the fish is acclimated high. In other words, there's some compensation going on here. And the commonest curve is the one that I think you probably saw or will see that uh, ecofish 
generated. It looks kind of like this one, um, where it's uh, you know it's kind of uh, concave down. Uh, but other fish have, have other kinds of curves, including a flat line where there's hardly any variation in the preferred temperature with acclimation. They always prefer the same band. It looks like some of the tilapias may work about like that. And then there's the reverse type where the fish actually select the highest temperature they select when they're acclimated low. And then lower their, ac their preferred temperature as they're acclimated higher and higher. And it looks like the piece of lids, the live bearers, do that for some reason. Gambusia, for example, shows this pattern in guppies. Um, and I don't know why, you know, other than the fact that maybe these fish are trying to get a jump on things by uh, taking themselves. Well, I don't know what it is. It might be an anticipatory response. In your, in your lab five, you're going to be uh, asked to think hard about how the sense in which the final temperature preferendum is really final. And the answer to the question, when you think hard about it and do the little uh, extra credit part at the end, which is easy to do, by the way, thanks to the template, is that it's final because if the fish is acclimated at any other temperature and put in a gradient, uh, it tends to prefer a temperature that's uh, closer to the acclimation. And as it acclimates, I mean, let's take even the extreme case uh, up here where a fish is acclimated to this lowest temperature in the case of this guppy. It prefers this temperature, so it goes to that temperature. What does that cause? That causes its acclimation state to go to the right, which causes its preferred temperature to drop a little in the case of the guppy, which causes its acclimation state to go even more to the right. And that keeps going until you get to this intersection. And once you cross the line, then it then responses in the opposite direction. So it's a it's a it's a, a regulating response. And it works the same if you go down here. You know, if you're acclimated real low, you're you're choosing a lower temperature, all right. But it's way higher than you're acclimated, and that causes you to acclimate upward, which causes you to choose a higher temperature, which causes you to be acclimated further upward, which causes you. And finally, you get to this temperature where you're acclimated to the temperature you're choosing, because therefore you're choosing the temperature to which you're acclimated, therefore you're acclimated to the temperature which you're choosing, and sort of zeroes in on that point. Some, uses, some use the word gravitate. I never liked that much because I think that implies gravity, and I wouldn't call this anything to do with gravity. Um, so anyhow, that's the way the final temperature preferendum is final. And I have talked about the fact that you would logically expect fish to prefer temperatures that are in some sense, if not optimum, at least tolerable, uh, well within the zone of uh, tolerance. And so I would sort of superimpose Zahn's three types of acclimation. You know, like this, typically there's a final preferendum that's somewhere toward the upper end of the zone of tolerance, the temperature tolerance polygon. Now, I've got these ends of these lines sticking out here, and, you know, I'm not sure they exist. Uh, you know, it may be that the line dead ends right there at the boundary. In other words, if you, you got a fish that's acclimated uh, lower than that, maybe this is a transient state thing. Maybe it does choose that just momentarily, but quickly it comes zooming into the zone of tolerance. If it doesn't, it's dead. So I'm not sure about the ends of these lines going past this blue line. So to my mind, you know, it would be a lot more adaptive to have a curve like the one on the bottom here, which is typical of a lot of different fish, including ecofish. So that just points out things are intersecting in there. Here are some measured preferenda, final preferenda, for different species. And they range all the way from down here around 12 degrees for lake trout. 13 for work that we did on Arctic Cisco, for example. So some of these cold cenotherms, you know, are way down there. And then you go up to uh, fish like carp and tilapia species that have final temperature preferenda above 30, probably 32 or 3 degrees. Um, many temperate zone fishes are in the upper 20s. The centrarchids, channel catfish, probably at 29. And these are juveniles. There's been a 
a, a big debate running for a long time about whether uh, there's a size effect on the preferred temperature. And to my knowledge, you know, there hasn't been any good demonstration of any consistent size effect. I think with species like yellow perch, people have found one. But I think the problem is that adults don't fit very well in the apparatus, so people tend to use juveniles. And nobody knows what the adults are doing. So I challenge somebody out there among graduate students, investigate the size effect on the behavior, the thermal preference behavior of ecofish. So what should you be thinking? You should be thinking, wait a minute, you know, if it's all run by metabolic scope for growth, and that's the rule, uh, hey, you know, when the fish gets bigger and bigger, it's, um, you know, it's going to have a different Arrhenius effect. It's going to be translated somewhat, you know. So what's going to be the difference between metabolic scope for a little fish and a big fish, big ecofish? And you'd almost have to run ecofish through its paces to, to find that out, I think. I couldn't really anticipate exactly how that would work. Maybe they'd be the same, but I'm betting they'd probably be different. So, uh, mechanisms. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to launch this. I may not finish it, but... Um, you know, at the beginning I talked about uh, the fact that the world uh, is a highly variable place and a lot of the components are are unpredictable. But some things are predictable, uh, either in a, you know, from a species point of view, you know, instinctive type things or individual learning. You know, the sun always rises pretty much in the east, maybe in the southeast or somewhere, but sets in the west or maybe the northwest, southwest. Um, you know, up's typically lighter than down. Uh, up is typically warmer than down if you're a fish, and it's above four degrees. Um, up has more oxygen usually, although, you know, you can have a, a layer of phytoplankton that are doing a lot of photosynthesis. You can have an oxygen maximum down at depth, but typically up is more oxygenated than down because that's where the air is. So there, and gravity, you know, pretty much is directional. And, uh, you know, shallow water tends to be more variable in all of its environment. You know, diel uh, fluctuations in temperature, for example, tend to be much more extreme in really shallow water than in deeper water. So these are predictable uh, components of environment. You know, toward the poles is going to be typically colder than toward the equator, you know, on, typically. And depending on the season, you can probably even refine that model a little more if you're an animal that thinks in terms of those kinds of scales of space and time. At the individual level, you know, the components of habitat uh, over the lifetime of an individual fish, some components are pretty well fixed. You know, the, the, the morphometry of the lake bed or the river bed, uh, where the old brush pile is, you know, where the riffle is, where the pool is. Um, where the big rock outcrop is, where the point is. You know, these are things that don't change too frequently. Now, sure, a big storm and everything's, you know, all bets are off. But a lot of the components of environment that are, you know, things like substrate related, uh, morphometry, uh, shape, those things are pretty much consistent through time. Temperature, DO, you know, well, temperature is usually higher during the day or late afternoon and lower at night, but it could be anything at any, on any particular day, depending on weather patterns. So I want to talk about the, what I consider an important subset of enviro regulatory responses that I think have been poorly uh, investigated and, and not very well understood, but are obviously logical when you think about it. And I call them predictive mechanisms. These are mechanisms that depend on some degree of the predictability of the environmental regime. Uh, a good example would be anticipatory responses to photo period because one thing you can be sure of is that days are going to get longer as you go to June, you know, at least until we get the shift, the state shift that we're looking at, some people say. Uh, you know, and, and the days are going to get shorter as you go toward the 21st of December. And animals can use that length of the day 
to anticipate the coming of winter and the coming of summer. Um, I talked about the fact that some components of environment are persistent over the whole evolutionary history of the animal. And so there's no reason to think that uh, there couldn't be an instinctive responses developed to those components. And other components are certainly predictable over the lifetime of the individual, even if they're not predictable over the longer term. And one of the most fascinating cases I know is the frail fin goby case. Uh, it's not really, well, it is environmental regulation. Um, and I have to look up this guy's name every time I do it. I don't have the citation. I think I put it in my notes, but I'm not going to dig around right now. Anybody fascinated by this, let me know, and I'll, I'll see if I can dig it up for you one more time. So, frail fin gobies, you know, they live in uh, rocky tide pools at the edge of the surf. And uh, this fellow was curious about the fact that when you try to catch one, it's hard to do because they'll jump out of that tide pool and jump into the next one and play hopscotch until they get right down in the open water. And so he did some uh, fairly neat and, I thought, clever experiments in which he took uh, uh, nets and put over the, you know, things and trapped them and caught them. And um, uh, he put them in a strange tide pool and chased them and you couldn't make them jump. In other words, if they didn't know where they were, they wouldn't jump because they knew it would be splat, you know. Um, On the other hand, when he dipped all the water out of the adjacent tide pool, and then scared the goby, and it was living in its home tide pool. It jumped into the, into the empty tide pool, splat. So it wasn't detecting the presence of water, you know. In the, it wasn't using some little water witching system. It was presumably what these frill fin gobies were doing was using what's known as latent learning to map the habitat. Uh, you know, they knew where the tide pools were because they were swimming over them when the tide was in and then when the tide went out and these tide pools were separated by dry land or muddy land or sandy land, I guess, rocky land. They knew where the next one was and they knew where the one after that was because they had this little map in their brains, presumably, that they had built. Each individual had built the map by experience. Uh, so, you know, fishermen always have stories that connect to that one. You know, they're pretty confident that, that fish know where they are in the system. They know where the brush pile is. They know where the point is. You know, you fishermen use that kind of information to be better fishermen. Um, evolution of migration, I guess. All I wanted to say there, I wrote a paper one time in a book called uh, Fish Migration chapter in it, the book I edited or co-edited with some other people. And in that chapter, what I argued was that, you know, uh, fish may start off using this other method uh, that we're going to talk about, uh, reactive regulation of environment, following the habitat around in space and time, through time, and over over eons and over generations of fish, um, those, uh, those patterns become... Uh, ingrained as instinct and so you know you don't have to find you don't have to go to the from latitude uh, 20 to latitude 40 to know that it's going to be colder after for many 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 generations of fish you've been migrating between latitude 20 and 40 and finding out that it's colder when you got there and doing you know doing the right things so my, my suspicion is that these patterns of migration like you see in things like Skipjack tuna, where they come through uh, Christmas Island, Johnson Island in the winter time, and then as spring comes on, they go up through the Japanese, uh, uh, through by Japan, and then they come around the Kushio Current to, uh, you know, off California and back south then to Hawaii. That that pattern repeating over and over and over has become ingrained. Um, I mean, that's a that's an idea. Um, reactive patterns, on the other hand, are ones that are don't depend on the predictability of environment. And they're the ones that animals have to rely on in the case of environmental factors that are, that are changing all the time in a very uh, haphazard way, where there's no predictability. 
And uh, I think what I'm going to do is, uh, well, just leave you with that, that there's the dichotomy. There's predictive responses, which have been very poorly investigated in any kind of a quantitative or experimental way, uh, the Frillpin Gobi case notwithstanding. But then there are reactive mechanisms, and that's where everybody's focused their attention. And there's a whole um, uh, labeling system that has been developed, taxis, kinesis, this sort of thing that we'll talk about next time. And there the idea is that the animal is reacting to present environment and to change in the present from the recent past. And it's just using that information. It's not predicting one step even in the future. That's, that's reactive regulation. Or it's, uh, it's just using present information. Now, not, not to say there couldn't be some directionality as there is in the case of taxis. We'll talk about that. And then I'll run some little simple uh, Stella models to demonstrate these, these different uh, types of reactive regulation. I'm working on one for predictive regulation. Uh, I haven't got that ready to, uh, it's not ready for prime time yet, though. But I'm, I don't know if I'll, if I'll have it ready this, for this group or not. Okay, we'll quit here. <clears throat>